So the gospel today takes some swerves and turns that we don't expect, as, as you would expect from the gospel and from God's word. So the crowd has just eaten, you know, Jesus just finished multiplying the loaves and then he crossed the sea, you know, walking on the water. And now the crowd finds him again and Jesus realizes they just want to <laughs> have bread and circuses. They just want to have more food. So he says, well, don't work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures. And then the, the crowd asks, they pick up on the work. Well, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Which is an interesting question, the way they put it. And Jesus makes it singular. This is the work of God that you believe. Now, how, how is believing a work? Is it work? Well, not the way it's usually conceived or too often conceived. It's, oh, let's see, do I, do I subscribe to this list of beliefs and do I want to follow the rules? And so I believe or I don't believe. It's all going on in your head and it's like, I can do it or not, you know. Well, that's not much of a work. We can maybe get a clue of where this can go if we take the word in Latin, opus dei, the work of God. All right, that's also a modern organization, but I'm certainly not talking about that. Opus Dei in, in Christian art tradition goes back to St. Benedict 1,500 years ago. And he used that phrase for the divine office, the chanting. And I did it for many years in the monastery. The chanting hours a day in, in, in choir. Uh, he said that's the work of God, Opus Dei, and you should prefer nothing to it. It's so important. So that kind of chanting, that kind of exertion was a work. But it's deeper than that. It's not our work. According to our Carthusian, our monastic statutes, it says when we do that, it's Christ praying in us as our head and for us as our priest, which is a quote from St. Augustine, who had a strong sense of, ours, of the the community as the body of Christ, the true body of Christ. So Christ is doing the work. So our work, if you want to call it that, is the surrender, the complete giving of ourselves, and that can be work, <laughs> to complete gift of ourselves to the Lord so that he can then do his work in us because he's the one that's praying and singing in us as our head and for us as our priest. And that's exactly what the crowd actually goes on to ask him. What can you do? And of course, they're looking for a sign. But the biggest sign is our transformation. That's the most important sign. That's the most important work that God can do. Once we surrender to let God do his work in us, which is to what? Well, if he's our head and we're the body, was to transform us more and more into his body really transform us more and more into himself so that we're the body of Christ and we have, as St. Paul says elsewhere, we have the mind of Christ. That's a lot of work for God to accomplish in us. So being a Christian is not kind of, you know, sitting in your armchair and saying, I believe and I don't believe and this and that. It's letting yourself be gripped and seized and transformed into a whole new creature which we were made for, we're made in God's image already, so it's not that much of a stretch in one sense, but to allow God completely to transform us. He does it first by nourishing us bit by bit with himself, Eucharist, right? But at every moment, and that's where all this imagery of the bread of life comes in. The real feeding of us is with Christ giving us himself. God does not just communicate his word with a small w, communicates himself in his word with a big W, capital W, which means himself. God communicates himself, as Karl Rahner said so well in his theology. So it's, it's this communication between God and ourselves in which he transforms us into himself in and through Christ. So that's what's happening in the, in the Eucharist. We're receiving Christ's own body. And again, St. Augustine had a really strong sense 
So receive what you are. We receive Christ's body because we are Christ's body, and the, that body makes us Christ's body. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just metaphysical or, quote, spiritual. It's physical. It's really down to earth. It's a complete emotional and intellectual and spiritual transformation that goes on. And he promises us, if we can say with the crowd, give us this bread always, if we mean it, if we're ready for it. So Jesus says, I'm the bread, the bread of life. Life itself, I am the resurrection and the life. In him was the the word in whom all was created. In him was life. It says again and again, Jesus is life. He shares his life, capital L, life with us, and we are transformed into that. We live with the divine life. That's why he can say in this beautiful phrase, which I'll sing later, whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me in this sense of complete entrusting of oneself, whoever believes in me, comes to me fully, will never thirst. How can we hunger and thirst when we're nourished constantly every moment by the divine life in us, by the bread of life himself, whether in the Eucharist or in every single moment? The Lord nourishes us with himself and transforms us into himself. And it quotes the the psalm that we just sang, the gospel quotes that psalm and, and refers to the Exodus story, which we have in the first reading. But I'd especially like to concentrate to see where this is really going, where it should bring us, to the second reading. And we've been following this letter to the Ephesians, you know, for weeks now. And it's just so utterly profound and marvelous and mysterious, which is why Christians never quote it. It's too profound. But let's look at it. So let's no longer live as we did before, or as the Gentiles do, so to speak, in the futility of their minds. (laughs) That's a phrase we can identify with if we're honest. Literally in the vanity of our minds, the futility. The Buddhists call it the monkey mind, you know. We're trying to go for mindfulness today, you know, the mindfulness, because we're so persecuted and tortured by our minds all day long. This constant inner chatter anxieties and fears and regrets and plans and all this stuff. We're just totally caught up and we identify with it as if it's ourselves, and it's not. It's just stupid, repetitious, and and useless. So let's surrender to Christ's action to get rid of all that in a life of deep prayer and attentiveness, to get rid of the futility of our minds. And and he goes on to say where where he could lead us instead. Uh, that you put away uh, the old self. Literally put off, take off like clothes. Take off the old self. And he goes on to say, put on the new self. So this is not just new age language, the old self, the new self, the false self, the true self. It's right here. Put on the new man, the new, new self. Put off, and it's purposely using the language of you know, taking clothes off and on, which is what happened in baptism. So baptism, you took off your clothes, you went down into the pool naked, and you came up a new self, filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's an ongoing process of transformation. So put off the old self, your former way of life, which is not enviable. Who wouldn't want to get rid of it? Corrupted through deceitful desires, through the desires of deceit. You know, and most of our desires are deceitful and misleading and don't go anywhere. Right? And be renewed. Transformation. Renewed. In the spirit of your mind. So not the vanity of your mind, but the spirit of your minds. And I preached before on this distinction between, you know, the mind and the spirit. In medieval epistemology and anthropology, the spirit was the highest part of your soul, of your mind, so to speak, beyond all this, this, this conceptual, you know, discursive claptrap that goes on. The spirit, where the Holy Spirit gets in, which is simplified and intuitive and reaches up to God, especially when God gets in there and lifts us up, renews us in the spirit of our mind by transforming us into Christ by the power of the spirit. So be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is 
Christ, who we are and who we're called to be. Created, it's a new creation, as Paul says elsewhere too, it's a new creation, according to God, in righteousness and the holiness of truth. By the way, just an interesting point, that was Cardinal Egan's Episcopal motto, in Sanctitate Veritatis, in the holiness of truth. So it's what we're called to. The holiness of truth, righteousness, it just means being transformed into Christ and letting Christ and his spirit govern our minds and our thoughts and our feelings and our actions because we're transformed in Christ. There's an almost identical phrase in Colossians 3 uh, as this one. It says, put off the old self with its former ways and put on the new self, renewed uh, in knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. So that's even clearer. We're made in the image of God, created in the image of God, God, Christ who is the image of God, and we're renewed in knowledge according to that image of the one who created us and recreated us and transforms us. So this is what we're in for if we really believe. We can't, as I say, we can't sit back and say, eh, I'm not interested in Christianity with its beliefs, and maybe this and maybe that. You're in charge. And is there anything more disastrous than your being in charge of your life? Tell me it's worked out for you. No. This is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent that you surrender your life, that's the greatest work you can do, to one who actually can run your life because you're created in that image and you're destined for that transformation. All of us are, Christians, non-Christians. We're all called to that transformation. And we who know Christ should be all the more on the, on the, uh, ready to, to surrender. And then God takes that work, he does the work, does God's work and transforms us more and more into Christ. So that in the end, and hopefully long before the end, so to speak, we can say, as, Jesus, as, Christ, as Paul does to the Galatians, I live, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now, he continues, is not in the flesh, is not my own, but is Christ, the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. So we surrender to the one who surrendered to us, who still surrenders to us, not just on the cross, but all through and constantly. We give ourselves as he's given uh, himself to us. And that's our destiny, to become, be Christ, all of us. So much so that, to quote St. Augustine for the third time, He has a wonderful, mysterious, and puzzling, and almost shocking phrase. In the end, there will just be one Christ loving himself. Wow. Just one Christ loving himself. In fact, loving the Father in the Spirit. All of us are just one body. All of us are just one Christ. So let's get with the program. All our happiness, all our potential, all our joy, all our destiny is there. Why would we not want to do it? All it takes is letting go of this miserable, egotistical self that we've, that's our old self that we clutch with such, you know, anxiety and let it go. Become who you're called to be, who you are. Believe in the one whom he has sent. Because whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. 